Let's pull up our sheet from before. Um, it's a very nice way for me to be able to send this out online. And certainly I like it when people, um, when people watch it. But the truth is, the, the big thing is the Bible doesn't say you preach for people to hear. You know, people get to choose whether they hear. The Bible says preach. It says in season and out of season. So guess what? We might preach something today and uh, somebody might tune into this later and it's going to bless them and because nothing gets old in God. And I'm coming down here and we're going to go back into reminding ourselves. Now we're using a little secret that we start from the back. And if you start from the back, not all the time, but I'm just saying what we're doing is starting from the back and we're looking at some of the things that we're learning from starting at the back. Now I want you to know afterwards is there's this new city called New, new Jerusalem, which is uh, gonna be, it's a big square city with, that's where you get the streets of transparent gold. It's not in heaven. I don't know what the streets are like in heaven. We only know what the streets are like in the New Jerusalem, but New Jerusalem is also referred to as the church, as God's people is also referred to as New Jerusalem. So I have a feeling that that city is going to have some kind of vibration that's going to be very interesting. It won't be on the land. It'll be suspended. And for a thousand years, uh, people will go in there. So remember, there's still a thousand years after here. And then there's a small time when the dirty devil's let out again to give people the choice. So people say, well, why would the enemy be allowed out again? Well, because you have a lot of people born in that thousand year period and they get to make their choice. Adam and Eve got to make their choice. Now, thing they will have been around playing. The Bible says they'll play with, remember, in the hole where the adders, where the snakes are and, and all that. Um, and so the same thing with Adam and Eve. They had no concept of how bad sin was. They had no concept of what was about to take over their life because they couldn't conceive of it. So they thought they were going after knowledge. As I said, she, the woman was going after knowledge and man was going after the woman. And that's my interpretation. If you can come up with a different one, that's fine with me too. Uh, so, I, and the reason I spent so much time last week about the Jewish people is because Jews are being saved as a higher percentage now than ever. So I did not want you to think when we're looking at this, when we talk about the Jews, I don't want you thinking that we're saying Jews aren't going to follow the Lord. No, it's increasing and increasing and increasing, and it's going to be increasing, and then there's going to be a mighty move. Many people suspect it's not a clear teaching, but when it talks about the 144,000, many people believe, because it's talking about 12,000 out of every other 12 tribes. However, there isn't 12 tribes anymore. Ten of them are lost. We talked about that last week. But somehow God can see things, and then there's going to be the 144,000 people have thought. I don't know. God's never shown me. All I know that this is a good thought. I like good thoughts until I get some understanding of the scripture that these are going to be powerful Jewish evangelists during the after the rapture that are going to go and influence and be used all over the world. And I would say that's very consistent because we've been talking about replacement theology, which means that God is never going to go back and look after Israel and look after the Jews. I disagree with that. And I believe there's a lot of scripture to disagree with that. And so they have not been replaced. And I believe that's why the church has to leave. The church has to leave so that Israel can fulfill and if you go back to some of the teachings, which I'm not versed well enough on, of the, the weeks of years, God left seven years in his prophecies in the Old Testament that have never yet been fulfilled. See, when you're God, your calendar doesn't have to be year after year because you're looking from eternity. And so he can have so many weeks over here and another week over here. That's why when you go to Acts chapter 2, we showed you how Peter said, this is that, this is the beginning of the last days. The last days began when Peter said they began because Peter was quoting Joel. And then what happens is when you read that in Acts chapter 2, it goes right through to the end from the very first to the very end of the last days, which is when all the moon and all of that, all that destruction is going to happen. 
So we want to go back here. And of course, as I said, so Jesus is going to come to Armageddon, which is the Valley of Megiddo, which there's going to be 200,000 soldiers. It says from three different sections of the world. I want you to remember a few weeks ago when we studied Jerusalem and remember the people that were living in Jerusalem at that time, which we assume is a certain number of Jews, probably religious Jews, because the Jews that are coming to Christ today are largely secular Jews. In other words, biologically, they have a Jewish heritage, but they don't have a lot of Jewish traditions in them. And then there's other ones that have more traditions and they hinder things in a different way. So remember when we talked over here with the two witnesses and, and the two witnesses came and everybody in Jerusalem was against those witnesses. And everybody in the world was against those witnesses. Do you remember that? It says that everybody, whether that's through the internet, through satellite, we have no idea, uh, everybody in the world could see what was happening. And I'm half and half excited because within 10 years and maybe even three, um, you know, there's going to be these masks that you'll put on and you'll literally be able to have a meeting with people around the world and sit in the same room with them. So you'll have a mask on and as far as you know, you're in the room and you'll turn to the right and Joe will be there, turn to the left and Mary will be there. And that technology is very, very close to coming to pass so that you won't just see them on a screen. You'll literally think you're in the room. So I'm half uh, excited about that just because it's so crazy interesting. And of course, we also know that that's gonna have a lot of other ramifications. So we know this group of Jews. So again, not all Jews. This group of Jews was really happy when the, when the witnesses, the two olive, brand, two olive trees killed, got killed because it said everybody went out and declared it was time to give gifts. It said everybody over the world, the whole world was giving gifts. Something happens when you read that scripture we talked about, remember? The guys get resurrected, which kind of wrecks your, their day, and then they go up, but even that doesn't make them repent. Can I tell you somebody else got resurrected and it didn't seem to shake anybody up? Okay, and there, I've seen miracles, and you'd think people would just be shocked by it, but they go, oh, that's interesting, and carry on. It, it's very interesting how we can block things from our mind. So here we have, again, because we studied this a few weeks ago, then what happens is as they go up, an earthquake comes within an hour or two. I forget how many, but certainly within that day. And then chaos happens, an earthquake happens, and then it says a great repentance happens. But see, this is this last group of Jewish people that are in that city, and a great repentance comes. Right after this great repentance comes, what happens? From all over the world, unity. See, the Tower of Babel was God's blessing, the judgment on man, because God said anything man has conceived, he can do. And so God didn't destroy the Tower of Babel. He destroyed people's communication. And it's all since then that you women can't understand us men and us men can't understand you. And we come, come from different cultures and different backgrounds and we don't quite, you might think one thing's a compliment and they think it's an insult. Um, and so here we have now something has caused, see over here, they were all in agreement with the Jews that were left in Jerusalem but something has happened now. These guys have repented and something has taken place and somehow the world thinks, how do I know this? Well, if you're gonna send 200 million, remember when that, those words were given, he did not see 200 million, he heard. He said, I heard 10,000 times 10,000 and two, two times 10,000 times 10,000. So what you have here now is this, Time, for some reason, when these people repent, everybody thinks their problem now is these Christian Jews that are in Jerusalem. How do you know that? Well, because 200,000 people turn up to, it says they gather in Megiddo, ready to come up to Jerusalem. So 
that means Israel has fallen at this point. Uh, but Jerusalem has not fallen. And so they all gather outside, getting ready to come in. And then that's when our wonderful Jesus comes in the way they were waiting for him. Remember, this was the way they were waiting for him because they misunderstood prophecy. Could you say this with me, misunderstand prophecy? That's one of our big problems. That's why study the Bible. Let God get you a, a thinking process, but don't be absolute on anything. I've said it the last few weeks. I was shocked. The people that I know that said they believed in the Bible, they were word people, they claimed things. And then they came along in 1988 when the guy wrote 88 reasons Jesus is coming in 88. And I told you, even I knew that wasn't true because I knew it said that it had to be at least a generation after Jerusalem and had come, so which would put it at 2007. And as I said before, a generation, they wanted to say a generation was 40 years in the Bible. It's 40 years, 50 years, 70 years. And Methuselah was 900 and... 69 years old, thank you. Um, so there's some reason the world thinks their problem is God and their problem is Israel. So they all gather to come up to Israel, but instead the word comes on a horse. The man comes on a horse. He's the man and he is the word. He's the man Christ Jesus and he's the word. And he comes on a horse to the air and it says out of his mouth, there's a sword, comes like a sword, it's the word. And then all these people say, I want the stones to fall on me because the glory turns up. The glory turns up. The word of God and the glory and the word of God slays them and they fall. And what happens is it doesn't say that Jesus comes to the ground. It just says he comes there to, and defeats them. And the Bible tells us he goes back over here to Jerusalem and then he must get off the horse because both the horse is the Holy Spirit, I believe, and the cloud is the Holy Spirit. And the, Jesus comes down on a cloud just east of the Eastern Gate. And then he comes into the Eastern Gate. And who welcomes him? All these people over here who are waiting to get destroyed because 200,000 people. Do you remember that scripture? When all the tri people had been around that that place where the prophet was and he said there's more with us come on than is with them right and i don't think that was gehazi but it was the servant anyways and the servant said my master my master my master there's this great big crowd here ready to kill us and the the prophet didn't even go outside he just said there's more with us than is with them and then the servant went outside and he could see the chariots of God. But if you check that out, the prophet never didn't need to go outside. See, if you believe something, you don't need to see it. But sometimes God will help us to see it because then it'll help us to believe it. Amen. I personally like seeing everything that I can see. So a lot of Jews are really going to shake the world up, probably right around here. And this is where Gog and Magog, and if you look north of Israel, unfortunately, and I can't prophesy this, but unfortunately it looks like Turkey could be arising and Russia is right north of Turkey. And uh, if you have any idea of what's going on in Turkey, um, but I can't say 100% for sure because see, it, it just says Gog and Magog and it says from the north, these people are gonna come and then God is gonna intervene here. So God's going to intervene here, which is going to be a massive revival in Israel because they're going to see it's going to shock the world. But guess what? The world is going to be shocked here, but they're still going to try to destroy Israel here. And we're back here, I think, heading out at some point, say at some point. What I would like to do today is go to a little different thing. It's still connected to that because we're calling this the timeline. So a timeline, I, I like to talk a little bit about time. And uh, so time has been around for a long time, right? Okay, we have God beginning the Bible, in the beginning God. So we know that God is not inside time. He is outside of time. Because God was there in the beginning of time. See, time actually is supposed to work for you and me. See, when we're free from time, we'll be in eternity. But time is supposed to work for you and me because it gives us... Um, 
It's a fence on our lives. None of us knows how many years we're going to live, right? Um, and at different stages, people have lived a lot less time than us. In some countries, they still live a lot less than us. But in other seasons, people lived a lot longer than us. So it's literally since 1500 BC was the first time that time began to be understood and measured. And that was the sundial. So all that time, everybody knew the seasons. They knew when it was spring, they knew it was fall. In the Roman Catholic Church, in the Dark Ages, the calendar was so messed up. See, we're living today. So we only know what we know today. Like they did a funny thing. Recently, they got a bunch of kids. Now, I, I don't want to insult any of you, but a lot of you were here when you put a, your finger in the phone and you went, <laughs> anybody remember those phones? Oh, some of you probably were there when they were, Hello, operator. So what they did as a joke, they got those phones and they gave them to kids today. Did anybody see that? Where they began to get the kids to try to figure it out. Now, see, you and I, because you saw your parents do it, it didn't take you long. But see, they'd never seen. They only saw beaming, 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 beaming. And because, see, we know what we know and they know what they know but they don't know what happened before. So what people have forgotten in the Middle Ages, um, the calendar was only 360 days. And so uh, after 100 years or 50 years or 70 years, it would start snowing in June in Rome. And whenever it did, the Pope would declare, it's now January. Now that would be a downer day, wouldn't it be? <laughs> you finally get to June and the predict says now it's January. And, and so eventually began to figure out that it shouldn't be 360 days, it should be 365 days. And then every now and then, you know, we have a leap year. What does a leap year do? It's kind of like a little catch up so that Joanne Sweeney can have a baby. Amen, on leap year. And um, which she did. And of course, Jim helped her, but it, so that's the, so they always try to make sure they're with their son on his actual birthday, because his actual birthday only comes up every four years, because he was on a leap year. So then time began to be more refined. So 300 years ago, we began to see clocks appear and a form of watches, okay? And, but see, we're all, we have watches, time pieces everywhere. Your car has a timepiece. Your cell phone has a timepiece. You have things all the time that have timepieces inside that you don't even know they have timepieces inside because there's clocks everywhere. But see, that's a new thing. 300 years ago, the big clocks. So we're looking here because we're trying to be like the sons of Issachar. And it says why they got complimented in the Bible is because they could figure out the times. And that's all we're trying to do. I'm not trying to tell you. I love the prophetic teachers. I love uh, Oxella and what's her, her husband's name? He died not long ago. But, but see, and they were so excited. I thought, man, you can tell they had that calling. But, but a lot of people still, they knew certain things and scientific developments would come up. But see, I couldn't watch them much because I knew they were just kind of repeating the same stuff. And a lot of big things even people didn't see coming. And there's a lot of things that happen you and I can't see coming. But I want to talk a little bit about time because the Bible says there's seasons and there are times. And we're now into a time when time is being defined. Uh, back here about, uh, was it 100 years ago or maybe less than 100 years ago, they tried a, a worldwide movement happened um, to get us into metric time. So you would move to 100 seconds every minute and 100 minutes every hour. And France started it up and they, they survived like 16 months. And then there was, um, because see, it's really hard to shift people. But if you'd been raised in, you know, a lot of your kids, they don't even know what degrees are or 
um, Fahrenheit, right? And they, or, or gallons, they only know liters and, and all these things because that's been a, f a framework uh, that's been changed. And then for 50 years, going from about the early 1900s to the 1950s, there was actually what was called the clock wars. So around the world, well, see, I didn't know that because that was really before my time. And they were fighting over time because time, where they were trying to take over time in Britain. And see, that's where Britain, time goes from Greenwich. And other countries were fighting, especially India, because they were trying to change things. Now, if you want to know more about that, talk to Mr. Google. I'm sure they can help you out much. But I thought, well, that's interesting that there's time. So now I also want to tell you, so the time has been here since the beginning, but it's been defined differently than we know now. That's the key. Things change. Um, God was before time, so he was in the beginning. And then Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, which again meant he was outside of beginning and outside of ending, okay? So he could be Alpha and Omega because we need a beginning and we need an end. And that's why death and time is really valuable for you because death forces us to deal with time. And that's why Jesus said, sorry, God said, uh, we've got to get man and woman out of this garden. Because the problem is they could get locked in with time. So we got to get them out of eternity and get them into time so that time can both work against them and can work for them in the same way that the Tower of Babel worked against man, but it also worked for man because it now caused mankind to fight each other, which kept them from getting into unity because into unity they can do all sorts of things and we find out at the very end they're going to get into unity all around the world and who are they going to be against? The Jewish believers that are left in Jerusalem. And they're all going to come in unity to come against the last place on earth that they think God has power. Now, as far as I'm concerned, all of us are going to be gone. If there's not a rapture, guess what? You get to die. Because it says if there isn't a rapture, it says there's this, all this stuff. And if you're a Christian, you're going to have to witness. You're going to get killed. So you just might as well hope for a rapture. If not, confess Jesus and get out of here quick. Amen? See, I'm not trying to teach theology. I'm trying to teach end times for thinking. And so I'm telling you that even time has been created for such a time as this. This is a time. And, and then we go on here, and, we, and it says, before the mountains were born. Isn't that neat how he puts it there? Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world. So the psalmist, which may or may not have been David in that psalm, he said, before the mountains were born, before the mountains were created, or, and, or, you, you brought, or before you brought forth the whole world, so in, in other words, before creation, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Can let's, we just all say that together? From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now... God doesn't speak good English. I don't even know what language he speaks. But it's scientifically, according to us, impossible to have two everlastings. It's the same way that God's name El Shaddai, they tell me literally it means uh, God Almighty, Almighty. See, we call it God Almighty, which is correct. But in their meaning, Almighty, Almighty, Almighty wasn't enough to describe God. And so there's the inference in that word that he's not just God Almighty, he's God Almighty, Almighty. What is he trying to do? Blow my mind. And he's doing the same thing here. See, he's trying to get you to realize that there's stuff outside of time 
And there is no such thing as everlasting, by the way, because when you leave here, you don't go into forever, because a lot of people say, boy, forever. No, no, you only go into now. When you leave the planet, you go into now. It's always now. It's not forever. There's not, I mean, there will be years until the earth disappears, and then it says there's going to be a brand new earth and a brand new heaven. So then, so from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Um, and then it says there is a season. So most of us still understand season, but remember, time has only been defined a whole lot better as an amazing movie. I don't know what it's called, latitude or longitude, I can't remember. But it's amazing um, when they discovered how to measure um, all the ships that never crashed anymore because they couldn't measure how to tell people where to find their way. And when longitude and latitude, and it's just maybe 300 years ago that they began to do that through equipment, and, and therefore they knew where they were on the ocean and they could go in and not crash. You don't have to know what I'm saying, but it's just all connected to time. And um, so time was um, in, invented, as I said, in the sundials 1500 BC, and I wasn't there and neither were these guys that say that, so that's where we're... They were kind of making an assumption. Up to then, you knew it was morning. When you get up, guess what it is? Morning. When you get hungry and the sun's in the middle of the sky, every farmer knows it's lunchtime. Amen? And when you get tired and the sun begins to go down, what do you know? Time to go home, okay? And when the lights are turned off at night, it's time to go to bed. And when the lights are turned on in the morning, that's how everybody went for all along, and then they began to define things. Now, there's no great spiritual significance, maybe, about this, but I'm going to tell you two very interesting things. In 1948, does anybody know what happened in 1948? Israel became a nation. Can I tell you what happened in time in 1948? That was the first atomic clock. So we've had lots of clocks, there was lots of watches being made, refined and defined and everything. But what took place in 1948, the first, an atomic clock. And this was a new definition of the second based on the resonant frequency of the resuium atom. Did y'all get that? What it meant was a finer clock. Now, personally, I don't know that we need a finer clock, but listen to this. Here's what scientists say. We need finer clocks. Now, that was 1948. Now, can I tell you what happened in 1967? Does anybody else know what happened in 1967? Jerusalem. In 1967, a whole new clock happened. Okay? And it was this new kind of... Um, clock was adopted and it was a new standard time unit. Now, see, to you and me, a second is a second, a minute is a minute, you know, and I always say Jane is just like Einstein, time is relative, you know, I'll get there when I get there, amen? And so far it's working out okay. Now, here's what scientists say. Here's what scientists say. See, you and I use our little clock to meet at the dentist at the right time, right? You and I have a, you go in there and punch in at, at your clock at work so that they can pay you for your full hours. But here's what scientists say. The precise measurement of time is of such fundamental importance to science that the search for greater accuracy continues. So they're still trying to get better clocks. They're try the atomic clock of 48 wasn't enough. The next definition in 67 wasn't enough because they said the better the time, the more they can connect to time, the more things they can invent the more things they can understand, the more things that work. Isn't that interesting? Does that seem interesting at all to anybody? Now we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15, 52. And here's God ahead of us. Because he's telling us what's going to happen. 
In, in uh, uh, Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, he's telling you about your future. In a flash. Come on, everybody in a flash. In the twinkling of an eye. Now, that's not the winking of an eye. Winking of an eye is too slow. It's that twinkling of an eye. Just as long as it takes for the light to catch your eye. Twinkling of an eye. It says, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Remember, trumpet is always connected to vibration. And so literally, we don't know for sure, but many people believe, and this seems scientifically sound, that when the Lord blows the trumpet, it's literally a vibration that will go. And God could send a vibration right through you. And all of a sudden, you're going to step from one zone into another zone. There's a great guy on the internet who was preaching what I preached for years. See, in this floor, there's more space than there is molecules. And in that speaker, there's more space than there is molecules, according to the scientists, and everybody believes them. But because there's more space in there and more space in here, they still don't go through each other. And when they ask scientists why this is, do you know what they said? Don't have a clue. They have no idea. Anna Reese used to explain to me that's why Jesus could walk through walls because he had his body was now a brand new body. See, when you get your brand new body, you get one where the molecules are in perfect order. And he explained scientifically as a scientist that your, the molecules in the wall are in chaos all since the fall. And when God puts your body into perfect order, because he didn't walk through any walls. He did walk on water by faith, but he didn't walk through any walls until afterwards, and you could just walk through a wall. That's why there's transparent gold in New Jerusalem. And Alan Reese explained to me that theoretically, because they can't prove it practically because no one can do it, but theoretically, they believe if the molecules that are in gold were in perfect order, gold would be transparent. And yet God, 2,000 years ago, showed John a vision of what was coming. And he showed him streets. See, I would never put down, streets of gold is pretty impressive. And most people think it's streets of gold because they don't read the Bible. But the Bible doesn't say streets of gold. It says streets of transparent gold. So these are things for us to say, well, maybe God knows something. And I know we're believers, so we got to believe God knows something. And then let's go back to verse 51, and then we're going to close for tonight. Verse 51 says, listen, I tell you a mystery. I like this. Do you want to get someone to listen to you? Go. I've got a secret to tell you. And you can speak lower. As soon as you tell people, I've got something to tell you. Their ears go up. And here's what he's doing. He's literally telling us this is a mystery. He's not making this up. He's saying, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, meaning our bodies, not all of us are going to have our bodies in the ground. We don't know which ones. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. And remember, that's just before when it says, in a flash. When will we be changed? In a flash. In the twinkling of an eye. And, and it says, the dead in Christ shall arise first. In a twinkling of an eye, they still get the head start. In the twinkling of an eye. In the twinkling of an eye, they get the head start. And then, and then we who are alive shall be caught up with them. And we shall be with the Lord. So these are very, very interesting things. And so we're, we're, we're jo my job is to decide. I'm out at New Jerusalem time. I'm certainly not at the time when the 200,000 are gathering around Israel. We're not at the time of the prophets. These are all things said. But we're here at this unknown time because the one, that's why I've said the second coming of the Lord to the earth is very easy to see. When you hear of 200 million people all getting in ships and planes and going to Israel, it's no secret. 
but it says there's a time, remember? And here's what will help you. When the Lord says he's coming, because he's in eternity, he doesn't define it the same way you and I find it. Same as if you look in Acts 2, when he says these are the last days, it starts like this, ends like that. He puts all the last days in four verses. And so God is doing the same thing. When Jesus comes to the air, he considers that the second coming. When he comes to the earth, he considers that part of the second coming. When he came to the earth the first time, he considered that coming as the servant, and then he's coming as the warrior or the victorious one in the second time. So that's how the church, I believe, will get out of here. We'll just keep giving you scriptures and scriptures. We could go on forever. I don't know that we will. Let's go on, at least go on till the rapture, okay? And then if there is the rapture, I don't want you turning up here the next week, all right? However, anybody that does turn up, get everybody to the front, get them on their knees and get them saved because you're gonna need to be saved. Father, we just thank you again for your goodness to us. You're giving us a sense of the, the times and the seasons and that even though we think time is the same, time is being defined by man, not by God. God knows all the milliseconds and nanoseconds and all these things, but by man, man is discovering what God has known all along. In Jesus' name.